this class deals with conducting surveys. Uh, we'll start with the preliminary study. Now, the preliminary study is important because it helps to avoid replicating any research work that was previously carried out. It also helps to refine the methodology to make sure that the methodology is appropriate mostly by examining previous work in the area and picking up from the experiences that the researchers had previously. So it learns from previous mistakes and from the criticisms of previous work. And all of this helps to suggest new research questions and helps to move forward the whole research area. Electronic sources have made it easy to check previous work uh, in the area and there are databases of previously held work for uh, examination. This is particularly true of course in the academic area where uh, academics are very open about their research and uh, share their ideas freely uh, amongst their colleagues. So in that area uh, electronic sources are very useful for picking out previous research work. Uh, commercially it may not be as, as easy as I'm suggesting here. Sometimes people want to protect their ideas and protect their uh, ways of doing things. So it depends on where we're, we're looking really. Generally checking earlier research is important uh, in academic research and less important in market research. Uh, in academic research it's important that the uh, current research is adding to knowledge and that means moving on from previous research whereas in market research companies are interested in uh, the current state perhaps current sales or in marketing and the effectiveness of marketing initiatives and so on so it's not so much looking backwards and looking at previous work done um, so it is, it's not so important for commercial purposes. Now the objectives and resources. Well, research should have clear objectives. The objectives should be consulted regularly to ensure consistency and direction in the work. So the objectives, the researcher should keep an eye on the objectives at all times to make sure that they're, it's consistent, that the work is following the line that was intended. Um, it should be simple and easy to understand the objectives. Um, if they're complex then it's easy to get lost and it's easy to lose the focus of the research. So the objectives of the research should be simple and easily understood. They should also be realistic in terms of resources available for carrying out the, resource, uh, for carrying out the survey. Um, the objectives should not be grandiose uh, if they're uh, under, if the resources are underestimated, then the the project will fail. So, the objectives should be clear, and also should be clearly budgeted and resourced at the start, so that there is a clear understanding of how much the whole exercise will cost and whether the resources are available to do it or not. Now in terms of surveys, well, a survey is a quick and cheap way of gauging the characteristics of the whole population. That's what a survey is. It's a quick and cheap way of gauging the characteristics of the whole population. The whole population may be the output of cars from the car company. That could be the population. And a survey could be a quick and cheap way of checking the quality of the cars. Or it could be that the population are the people in the country or students at university or at colleges. Whatever the population is, whatever is decided is the population, a survey is uh, a quick and fairly cheap way of examining the characteristics of the population. So a survey should be drawn from the target population. It should come from that population. That's the most efficient way of doing it. If the survey is related to uh, the attitude of students towards library resources at a particular college, 
then only students who attend that college should be interviewed. That's the target population. The target population are students who use the library. And a survey should be drawn from those people. The, sur the survey should be selected from the population in such a way as to make it representative of the population. The survey should have the same characteristics as the population. As I just said in the case of the example from the library, um, if the survey is to check the characteristics of the opinions of students who use the library, then the, the target population are students who use the library and the survey should be drawn from them. So if we have a population, that's the population, then the sample should be drawn from that population. It should be a subset of that particular population. Now deciding on the sampling frame, well the sampling frame is the listing from which the sample for the survey is to be drawn. So the sampling frame is the list from which the, sur uh, the sample for the survey will be drawn. Ideally this should be a listing of all members of the target population or as close as possible. But ideally it should be all the members of the target population. Examples of commonly used sampling frames, well the electoral rolls that gives an indication of people in the country or people who are entitled to, to vote in the country. Telephone directories, list of subscribers. Um, it only lists subscribers so I suppose care should be uh, needed because there are a lot of people in the country who don't have a listing on the telephone directory. So not exactly um, a good source. Business directories, yellow pages, um, memberships of uh, commercial organizations such as the Chambers of Commerce or Institute of Directors if they were available. So it depends. Uh, a sampling frame should include all of the members of the target population. That's the point. But it rarely does include everyone. Uh, normally there are people missing or organizations missing. Now the data collection methods, well there are two tasks. Decide on the sample design for the survey, the way in which the survey will be conducted. So design, decide on the sample design. Um, then decide on the sample size. Bearing in mind the bigger the sample size the more accurate the results will be. If uh, if you wanted to find out the opinions of the British people about the quality of television and you ask one person, it's not a very good indicator of what the, the British people think about the quality of television. So the sample size is important. These tasks help to ensure that the survey produces sufficient information about the population and meets the set of objectives. So having a good sample design, the way in which the survey will be conducted and also how it will be analysed and having sufficient sample size, these are important. Now let's look at questionnaire design. Now questionnaires may be administered in different ways. Respondents may be asked to self-complete. Respondents may be asked to tick the boxes themselves to fill out their own uh, opinions about certain issues. Or an interviewer or helper may be used. The questions should be designed in such a way as to minimize both non-response and bias caused by incorrect responses. Uh, when asking questions, care must be taken not to intimidate the respondent by using language which is technical or uh, archaic or um, difficult to understand language. It's, it's important that the language is clear so that the respondents can give clear answers and correct answers. 
the whole exercise is to try and minimize errors and get a good response rate. There are many possible sources of error when carrying out a survey. Sampling errors by drawing the wrong respondents. Now, how you select the respondents for a survey is very important. The best method is known as random sampling. It's best because there's very little bias or perhaps no bias in the selection procedure. Random sampling means that every person selected, if there are people selected, every person selected will have an equal probability of being selected. Now that's the best, but that's expensive and it's difficult, it's complicated as well. Um, so generally speaking companies settle for less they use other techniques they may stop people on the street and ask their opinion but that's biased what people are stopped on the street um, the the person stopping the people on the street may be using personal prejudice or bias in some way <coughs> bias bias happens all the time bias could be convenience just stopping person because it's convenient to do so rather than making an effort to to try and find a more representative uh, set of respondents there are errors caused by the interviewer usually as I said involving bias and the interviewer may lead the respondent in answering the questions as well what this question means is and the respondent gives the answer. Sorry, the the interviewer gives the answer to the respondent, and the respondent agrees. That's not right. The idea was that the respondent gives the answer. The person being stopped should give the answer and not be led by the the person asking the question. It could be recording errors. The interviewer misunderstands responses and records them wrongly could be that the interviewer simply writes down what was not intended by the respondent, misunderstood the answer and wrote down the wrong thing. There are also errors in editing. Responses may be poorly recalled and misanalyzed. So even if the response coming back were accurate, when they get back to the office for editing and for analysis, they may be uh, copied out badly or uh, interpreted wrongly or misanalyzed. So the errors can creep in even at that stage. There could be errors in coding the answers. Questions may be coded to facilitate analysis and this may not be done properly. The questions may be classified wrongly and the answers may be uh, mixed up with different questions and it's not clear cut. Um, that the true answers are going to be picked up even if they were written down by the interviewer and taken back to the office they're going to be picked up at the analysis stage. There are errors in analyzing the data. Uh, analysis of the data may use the wrong method. There may be miscalculations and misunderstandings of some terms depends on how it's going to be analyzed in the office. It could be using some statistical um, program and perhaps there's no expertise in the office to understand the program completely and errors creep in that way. So there are calculation errors that may be involved. A good pilot survey could help identify the errors and uh, help to solve the errors before the main survey was conducted. So pilot work is important but again it adds to the expense. Um, it delays the main work as well. It sets back the work because the pilot work has to be done first and that means the main work can't be done until after and so on and so on. Field workers, well People collecting the data are called field workers. They must be trained in the required methods of collection. Both the response and error rates are sensitive to how the interviewer acts. 
So field workers have to be properly trained. They can't just be sent out with a clipboard and some questions. Depending on the size of the survey, jobs need to be carefully organised and the lines of communication and authority clearly established before the survey begins. So it's clear that the field workers need organisation. They need to have clear lines of communication and they need to have the authority to conduct the survey. They need to be validated, if you like, by the organisation. They need to be approved by the organisation so that they have been trained and they are capable of coping with issues as they arise. If problems arise with the survey, if the respondent asks questions or doesn't understand the point, that the point can be clarified without introducing bias. So field workers are very important. The processing methods, well, large surveys need a clear management plan. And the management plan relates to the data and how the data will be analysed, how it will be collated, how it will be presented. So there is a, if you like, a data management plan. But the management, the overall management of the, the project, should take responsibility for how the data will be processed and how it will be delivered. The plan must set out all the processing steps required in the survey. So there must be a, a clear plan when the data comes back and it should set out all the processing steps required in the survey. Right from the data collection through to the final analysis and presentation. The plan should set out um, a set of quality control procedures to be followed to ensure the accuracy of the data and its analysis. So that it should be clear that every effort was taken on the part of management to ensure that the final findings, the final conclusion of this exercise was accurate and it was as much as possible was done to avoid bias and miscalculation and misinterpretation and so on. That the final results were as accurate as possible. Documentation. Well, surveys need documentation and this should be, obviously, it should be well designed. The data collection instrument should be clear and well structured. Uh, stru structured. Uh, data collection instrument could be a questionnaire or it could be a set of questions for an interview. So the data collection instrument should be clear and well structured. If it's a mail questionnaire, uh, it will also need to be to have a, a covering letter, envelopes addressed to the members uh, of the sample, and usually return envelopes with postage paid. These will help to get the results back, but there's a lot of work to be done to ensure that the, the mail questionnaire is clear and short and simple so that the respondents have an incentive to fill it out. If it's complex and lengthy, it'll probably go into the waste paper bin. If data collection is by interview, there will need be a need for the interviewer instruction sheets. So the interviewer should have timesheets. Uh, when was the interview conducted? Where was it conducted? Even something about the setting. Where was it conducted? There should be expense sheets because this whole exercise will take up resources and there has to be a budget for the exercise right at the start before it, it was worked out and the expense sheets are important to ensure that the, the exercise is within budget. There may also be sheets separate uh, to the interview schedule itself for recording the responses. So these have to be prepared in advance. Now the staffing, well depending on the size of the sample the following staff may be required. Field workers, those are the people who conduct the, uh, the survey. Data processing staff 
for example, uh, statisticians, computer staff to facilitate the analysis. Um, the staff necessary for the survey uh, should be involved from the start to ensure that the right data is collected in the most suitable form. So the statisticians and the computer staff should be involved in the design of the forms right at the start to ensure that it all fits smoothly into the, the final part which is the data analysis. Now pre-test and pilot work. Well before a large, survey, uh, a large survey is conducted it's important that a small scale version of the survey should be tested. This is just to iron out problems. This is the, the pilot test. Uh, this will test the questions for errors and make sure that the, the survey is possible. Vital planning steps before the launching of a survey are one, testing the questions to make sure that they can be understood and easily answered. That's important. Make sure that the questions can be understood and easily answered. And secondly, uh, running a small scale pilot version of the whole survey. These are referred to as pre-tests and pilot surveys and they help to iron out errors and problems in the full survey later. These are very important uh, activities because they polish and get rid of the errors. They polish the work that's coming and get rid of the errors that are likely to take place. So pilot work is very important. But it does take money, it is expensive, it takes time and it sits back the, the, main, uh, the main piece of work. Now pilot surveys and sampling frame. Well, the pilot survey may be used to check whether uh, a sampling frame is complete. In other words, uh, it may be checked entirely. So the pilot survey may be used to check whether the sampling frame is complete. Now, in other words, uh, if it can be checked entirely, it, it means that the the sampling frame, which is what has been aimed at, the pilot work enables the researchers to test whether the main survey, when it happens, will be able to access the entire sampling frame. If there are issues that are stopping it from accessing the main sampling frame, there could be all sorts of issues, um, location, legal issues, um, identification of the sampling frame itself, there could be all sorts of issues uh, involved. You could also check whether the uh, whole activity is up to date. It not just checks the robustness of the questions and the procedures, but it checks whether um, the whole activity is up to date, if it's doing the job that's expected of it. And whether indeed the uh, questions are accurate, whether the, the questions are relevant, and whether they are going to be to be used effectively uh, in drawing the conclusions later. There may be redundancy in the questions. Some of the questions may not be needed. So um, the pilot survey addresses all of these issues. Um, it also looks to see if the, the whole exercise is convenient. In other words, uh, are the questions easily understood? Are they well presented? Um, is there a logical structure? How much time will the whole thing take? Because respondents will not give a long time for uh, an interview or for a questionnaire. Uh, a few minutes would be the maximum perhaps for busy people working in the city. So is it convenient? Uh, is it done in, in a spot that is convenient as well? Um, the location of where it will be uh, where it will take place. It can all be checked via the the sampling, uh, the pilot sample I should say. 
it is not possible to improve uh, any of these or move to a different sampling frame but it is useful to be aware of the inadequacies um, it, may, it may be that the, the pilot has thrown up lots of issues and they can't be fixed but at least now the uh, interviewers and the surveyors are aware of the inadequacies of the final full piece of work and they're able to present that work subject to these limitations. There's also an issue of the variability of the population um, and the variability of the population should determine the sample design and the size. If the population is very variable in its characteristics then a wider sample will be needed. If the population is very almost homogeneous, if it's very similar, then a smaller sample would be useful. The pilot survey can usually contribute only a rough estimate of variation within the population because it's based on a very small sample. So care must be taken uh, when preparing the final main survey that the researchers are aware of the variability in the population. If it's a highly variable population then a bigger sample size will be required. The, the uh, pilot survey may be the only guide available but bear in mind that a small pilot survey with a highly variable population does not mean um, true figures can be expected, true and accurate figures of the uh, target population characteristics can be expected. More than likely only a very rough estimate can come back. Now the response rate, well pretests can indicate the likely response rate of the full survey. Uh, it certainly can throw up issues um, bad questions or misunderstood questions and so on and this can be refined so which can help the response rate the response rate may be improved by rewording the questions well, the pilot survey could indicate how that could be done and it can also by changing the collection uh, the data collection method um, so changing the method of collection may improve the response rate perhaps even shortening the the questionnaire or the number of questions um, but the the pilot will indicate these problems and these issues and be uh, be a good indicator of, of remedial action that can be taken before the main activity takes place before the main survey takes place now the data collection process the pilot survey may be used to assess various collection methods for costs and effectiveness and ways to avoid bias. So the pilot survey is useful in setting up the main project. It looks at the collection methods, the, the data collection methods, the costs that are involved as well and the effectiveness. Where will the survey take place? Um, how much will it cost to to conduct the survey and what bias is involved in the activity. So the, the pilot survey is useful for all of those. And it also enables the management to observe the interviewer's work. So the interviewers can be checked and see if there's further training required before they're sent on the main uh, survey itself. It could also be used to observe the respondents to see what their reaction to the questions are. Uh, they may show surprise, for example, or shock at some of the questions, or uh, they may have various responses to the questions, and this may mean that the questions need changing, uh, need alteration, and maybe if they're showing confusion, perhaps because the questions are out of sequence. So 
observation of the respondents during the pilot survey is also important. Now, questionnaires. Um, questions may be ambiguous, biased and leading. Many don't know answers may include, uh, may indicate, I should say, that a question is not understood by the respondent. Um, questions can be uh, compound, for example. Do you believe that the government is doing a good job and should increase old age pensions? Now, that's two questions. That's a compound question. So people don't know which, what the answer is. There can be even more extreme examples than the one I've just given you, but that illustrates that people confronting a question like that may say, well, I don't know what the answer is. So those sort of questions have to be uh, identified at the pilot stage and taken out. Pilot surveys are particularly suitable for checking self-completion questionnaires. Um, so when uh, questionnaires are to be completed by the respondent, then pilot surveys are particularly useful because it can identify a lot of issues and can help simplify the questionnaire right at the very start. When interviewers are used in pilot surveys, the reports are particularly useful in, in improving the questions. So interviewers used at the pilot survey stage can feed back a lot of information which can help to polish the final survey itself. Now the instructions, well, the instructions for completing the survey must be clear. A pilot survey should show any inadequacies in the instructions. That's what the pilot survey is to do. And it should also help to show the reason for any unanswered questions. Uh, the pilot survey should indicate the reasons for any unanswered questions any problems with the form design and given an overall view on the positive and negative points associated with the design. The, if problems are identified at the pilot survey stage then changes must be made to address these problems. That's the purpose of the pilot survey. There's no point in having it unless any recommendations from it are worked upon. And ideally a second pilot survey should be run to test the changes that the first pilot survey had recommended. That's ideally, it very seldom happens, but in an ideal world that's how it would work. Now the duration of the survey, well pilot surveys are given uh, give an indication I should say of the time scale for the survey exercise. If the pilot survey looked at 10 respondents and the final one was to be 100, then perhaps a factor of 10 could be applied in terms of time. If male questionnaires are used, a pilot survey will indicate the likely completion uh, and return dates. So it's just an indication of what's likely to happen and also look at the, the non-response rates indeed. The time needed to process the pilot survey will give an indication of the likely processing time needed for the survey itself. So the, the pilot survey does feed back quite a lot of information regarding time and process. The survey costs, well costs associated with the pilot survey can be used to estimate the total cost of the survey, uh, but generally speaking there's a budget that's allocated right at the start to cover both the final and the pilot surveys. But the pilot survey would be an indicator of whether it's going to be over or below budget. Now the target population and sample population, well the target population is the group about which information is required. That's the target population. The sample population is the group from which the sampling is drawn. It 
may not always be possible for the two to coincide. Uh, there may be issues in contacting people, uh, maybe issues in finding the people. So um, sometimes when a sample is drawn up, it doesn't mean that all the people identified for the sample can be contacted. They may have moved house or they may not be available when the interviewer calls or they may not be willing to participate. Now this could be because of the sampling frames avail is available is not a full listing of the population. Well, it's very difficult to get a full listing of the population. If it's a population of cars coming off the assembly line, that's quite straightforward. But if it's a population of people, if it's a population of, let's say, university students, it may not be possible to get a full listing because sometimes people who were students cease to be students, drop out or leave or graduate or do something, just drop off the list for whatever reason. So it's not always possible to get a sampling frame of the, the full population. Sampling from some part of the target population may be too difficult or expensive. For example, uh, when drawing up the sample, if they had to interview somebody who lived a long distance away, well that may be very expensive and uh, for that reason that person may not be interviewed. So that's a problem. Surveys and censuses. Well, a census is carried out uh, information is gathered from every member of the population. It's obviously very expensive. Surveys are also faster and less labour intensive than census, so surveys are preferred. And sometimes surveys can be more accurate than full censuses. Um, a full census, for example, may have uh, people missing people didn't fill out the census at the start or um, a full listing of the the population could not have been achieved for, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, perhaps people were not listed on various databases or whatever. So sometimes a survey, oddly enough, could be even more accurate than the, the census. Um, better quality staff can be applied as fewer are needed, so surveys can actually get better results than a census. Checking the whole population may stretch resources to the end. If, if checking the, uh, the attitude of the whole population regarding some issue, that would require a lot of resources. Perhaps fewer, asking fewer people, but doing it in a more qualitative way might be a more uh, appropriate uh, method. More checks can be carried out on the completed data collection forms as well to see that they were completed correctly and uh, more time can be spent in uh, data processing at the end. So the, the data processing exercise can be more precise and more accurate. Interviews can be carried out in greater depth as less of them are needed. So generally speaking it's, it's a, a more uh, qualitative approach to finding data. If everyone was interviewed the resources would be too thinly uh, spread and some of the interviews may be too short or hurried or with little care and attention paid to the responses because there was so much work to be done. With fewer it can be more considered and um, better quality work achieved. So oddly enough a survey might be better than a full census. Now the advantages of a census, a census well generally a census does not have perfect uh, accuracy because generally it does not attempt full coverage and is unlikely to ever achieve this. Even a census of the whole population of a country is never 100% accurate. There are always people who don't fill out the forms or people who are 
missing or traveling or uh, get missed off for various reasons. So a full census is never 100% accurate. However, a census provides a way of obtaining sufficient volume of data to facilitate analysis right down to small segments of the population. So if a census is carried out, then it's possible to look at substrata in the population. So if a census is carried out, you maybe say, well, here's the total number of people living in the country, of which X percent are female, Y percent are male. So you're interested in, let's say, in males. Uh, of these, so many live, so many are of this age. So we're looking at that age. So it's possible to to work out from census data quite a lot of the characteristics of the, the total population, let's say, of the human population of the country. Um, and then conduct the survey with that in mind. But um, these are some of the issues involved in conducting uh, surveys. It's a very quite complex issue in many respects and it's important that you go across the video a few times, stop it and make your own notes and fill out your notes from any sources that you find online. There are many sources online about this. There are many many published articles available freely online. I suggest you go through them and pad out your notes and make a good set of notes so you know exactly the issues involved in conducting surveys. But that concludes this video. Uh, so thank you for watching.